met. The prophecy that we will be looking at this evening, brothers and sisters, began over 2,500 years ago, and it predicted the entire course of human history with perfect exactness from the time it was given all the way to now. This prophecy is so powerful and accurate, it has made atheist believers. And I am praying that tonight, as you look at this amazing prophecy, you will walk away saying the Bible can be trusted, that Jesus can be trusted, and that the Lord Jesus himself is coming again soon. Let's take a moment and ask the Lord to bless our time. I invite you, wherever you are, whether you be here in the pews this evening or you're watching on our recording, bow your head where you are, and let's ask the Lord to be our teacher this evening. Heavenly Father, as we learned in yesterday's prophecy seminar, your word is truth, and we can be sanctified by that truth. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would come, that you would be our teacher, and like you did with Daniel of old, you would show us what this prophecy means, what it means for us today, and how it teaches that no matter how difficult things may be, we may always trust our heavenly King. This we pray in your Son's name. Amen. I'm reminded of a story of a little boy named Tommy. We're changing his name just to protect him in case we need to. Tommy was living in a war-torn country. It was routine during the night to hear the air raid sirens as the enemy air force would drop bombs on all the surrounding towns. One evening, Tommy is getting ready for bed when all of a sudden the womp, womp of the air raid sirens began to go off. Tommy knew what he had to do. He had to get out of bed, go down the stairs, make his way through the living room and continue into the basement in order to get to the bomb shelter that they all, that they all owned. And Tommy was doing exactly what he was supposed to do. That is, until a bomb tore its way through the ceiling of Tommy's house, through the center, and exploded in the middle of his home. Luckily, and praise the Lord for this, his home did not fall. But as the explosion occurred, flames began to come up the stairway, which was Tommy's only way out. He rushed back to his room and closed the door, but very soon he began to see the flames leaking underneath the door frame, an enemy invading him, even though, of course, he wanted to be safe. There was no other choice. He had to jump out the second story window. He rushes to the window, he opens it up, and he begins to yell down for help, but he couldn't even see the ground. The smoke of the house was billowing up. The plumes were so dense and dark, Tommy couldn't even, couldn't even see out his window. And he yelled out, he said, somebody help me! Is there someone who can help me? And he heard a voice he had known since he was a baby, the voice of his father. His father said, Tommy, jump! And Tommy begins looking, but he can't see anything. He says, Father, how can I jump? I can't see you. But of course, the father said, but Tommy, I can see you. If you trust me, jump. And Tommy, knowing he could trust his father in the past, the present, and the future, he trusted his father with his very life. And he jumped out of the window, not because he could see the father, but because the father could see him. And of course, as the sun came down, the father dutifully caught his baby boy and walked him and carried him to safety. You know, brothers and sisters, we find ourselves asking questions like that little boy as well. Father, I cannot see you. Have you ever found yourself asking a question? Let's get my slide going here. Can we get this working, Bob? We go okay? Let me know if we're good so I can try moving on. There we go. We also have asked questions before, haven't we? Like, can I trust the Bible? We've asked questions, can I trust God that he is in control of the future? And as we watch human history continue over centuries and centuries, can I really believe that Jesus is coming again soon? You know, this idea of trust, it is integral to Bible prophecy. We see that God perfectly describes human history from past 
and present and future. And as we see God perfectly describe history, we learn we can trust God. And if I can trust God with my past, that means I can trust God in the present, right? And if I can trust him in the present, I can trust him with my future. And if I can trust God with my future, then I can trust God with my very life. You know, that's one of the main things that Bible prophecy is here for, friends. It is here to teach us that we can trust our Father who is in heaven, that we can trust that Jesus is the one in control, that even when the plumes of smoke of this world rise up and they blind us to seeing the presence of the Heavenly Father, Bible prophecy teaches us that we can always trust God above. You know, some people want to study Bible prophecy because they like the doom. They like the gloom. Do you have a friend in your life or never ever met someone who all they do is like drama? <laughs> you know, they just, it's, it's, like, it's like they're the flame and you're the poor moth and you're just dragged into whatever that they're going through, right? I have one of those in my life. I was just talking to them the other day and they were rip snorting mad and I'm just talking. I was like, what's, like, what's the problem? Do you need me to come help you? They said, yeah, I'll tell you the problem. I missed my turn half a mile ago. Now I gotta turn all the way back around and go on back there. I'm like, you're not living in Gaithersburg, <laughs> you know? A half mile won't cost you an hour, right? But that's just drama. Now, some people, they come to the Bible prophecy because they want the drama. They want the doom and the gloom. And don't get me wrong, there are some scary things in the Bible prophecy. There are some dire warnings God wants us to know. But we need to remember the Bible prophecy is not meant to bring you to despair. It's meant to bring you to hope to know that Jesus is in control, that you can trust him, that even when things are spiraling out of control, the Lord has everything in his hands. And tonight I want to show you a Bible prophecy that proves beyond a doubt that you can trust God with everything. This Bible prophecy was written in the book of Daniel. It was penned over 2,500 years ago, and it tells us with beautiful exactness exactly what to expect with human history, but it ends in the most glorious kingdom you will ever know, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And as we look at this Bible prophecy together today, you are going to learn that you can trust your Bible. You're going to learn that you can trust that the future is under God's control, and you can trust that Jesus is coming again soon. Now, I tend to talk to a lot of different kinds of people. I love talking with people. Everyone you talk to is an adventure. It's a story that you would never hear if you didn't ask them to tell it. I get to talk to Christians. I get to talk to Muslims. I get to talk to atheists. And I've had atheist people come to me and say, okay, pretend I was open to thinking the Bible was trustworthy and true. How would you prove to me I could trust the Bible? And every single time, I go back to Daniel 2, and I ask them, I said, if I can show you a Bible prophecy that was able to predict human history accurately for over two and a half thousand years, would you be willing to accept the Bible? Now, they say, of course, like, if you can do that, and we come to Daniel 2. Now, here's the thing. I've done this with dozens of atheists. Not all of them came to accept Jesus, I'll be honest. But I have never walked away from an encounter like that and have them not say, wow, I didn't know the Bible could do that. I actually had even someone try telling me, no, 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 the book of Daniel, that was probably written in, I don't know, the year 1000. Maybe it was written in 1950, <laughs> right? Because they had to get around the idea that this prophecy was so powerful. And I want to show you this prophecy tonight. Maybe you've heard it before, or maybe it's your first time. Regardless, I want you to allow the beauty of this prophecy to touch your heart to sink into your mind, and to let you know that of all things, you can trust God and you can trust his word. Let's look at it together. As we look at the prophecy tonight, I'm having a trouble with this clicker, Bob, my friend. That's all right. Can you flip the slide? We'll just keep on going and see if we can make this work. All right, there we go. In the prophecy tonight, you're going to be introduced to a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is king of a nation called Babylon. It was the world superpower of its day. And in the year 605, Nebuchadnezzar leads an army and he attacks God's holy city, Jerusalem. 
and he wins. And not only does he win, but he takes the cream of the crop with him, the treasures, the money, the gold, and the people. See, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't some sick, you know, psycho who just massacred everyone. He wanted the best of every city to go back to Babylon to make Babylon the greatest nation possible. And so Nebuchadnezzar found all the young men of learning, that is the most wisest of people, trained in the king's court. He brought them back to Babylon to serve in his king's court. And one of those young men was a boy named Daniel. Now, Daniel was a very bright young Jew, but he was not just like any other Jew. You see, Daniel had the gift of prophecy. And not only did he have the gift of prophecy, he was given the gift of interpretation of that prophecy. You know, sometimes, you know, we, we think that those are just one of the same gift. The Bible doesn't teach them as the same gift. The Bible says to some are given dreams and to others the interpretations of those dreams but God trusted Daniel so much, he gave to him both of these unique gifts. And even though Daniel was in the heart of a pagan land, he never forsook God. He never allowed the ways of evil to penetrate his heart, even though it almost cost him his life time and time and time again. This young man stayed true to God. And God was proud of Daniel. God even elevated Daniel to become one of Nebuchadnezzar's most trusted advisors. You know, when I talk about Daniel like this, I want to be like Daniel. I want God to look at me and say, even though you were in the heart of a pagan land, you never once forsook me. I want God to look at my heart and say, you are a man of so much integrity. I can have you serve me anywhere because I know you'll always bring me glory. And I don't know what you do for a living. I don't know what, where, where God's put you. Maybe you're a bank teller, cashier at Walmart, an executive and a CEO or a CFO. I don't know. But re- or maybe, you know, you're like my wonderful wife, a stay-at-home mom raising two wonderful children. But wherever God has put you, ask yourself the question, am I serving him in a way that glorifies him? When God looks at me, is he proud of me? Not because I'm perfect, because none of us are. But am I doing my perfect hardness, right? The hardest I can to glorify my God in heaven. Because when God looked at Daniel, he looked at me as well pleased. He could trust Daniel in the king's court. And this was necessary. Because God was about to do something amazing in Babylon. That he needed a man of God in the right place at the right time. Because God was about to send Nebuchadnezzar dreams. And Daniel would be the one anointed who can interpret it accurately. Let's begin looking at the prophecy together, shall we? Picking up in Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, here the Holy Scriptures read, Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So, so they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. So they came and stood before the king. I'm sorry, did I do that one already? I did, yes. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I've had a dream. My spirit is anxious to know the dream. Let's pause here for a moment. This is what's going on with King Nebuchadnezzar. At night, he has an extremely disturbing dream. Just go ahead and raise your hand, whether you're in the pew or at home. Have you ever had a dream that just unsettled you? Made you feel maybe a little weird inside the the hairs on the back of your head stood up? You know, I've had times where I wake up, I don't even remember what my dream was, but still something about it lingered with me. It chilled me to the bones. And this is what's going on with King Nebuchadnezzar here. He has a dream. He wakes up, he doesn't remember it, but he remembers the way it made him feel. And he is terrified and he is anxious. But why terrified? You see, back in those days, they looked at dreams differently than we do now. 
when we look at dreams, we just think that they're images in the middle of the night, you know, uh, maybe you ate a weird piece of cheese that's coming out in the middle of a dream, right? But that's not the way they saw dreams. They did not see dreams as images of the night. They saw dreams as messages from the gods. And so Nebuchadnezzar, believing he is a conduit of God here on earth, believes he gets a message from the gods and he can't even remember it. So in his mind, he's thinking, the gods are trying to communicate with me and I don't know what they're saying. Have you ever had someone call you with an emergency call on a cell phone? You know it's a problem, it's an emergency, but the reception's so bad, you don't even know what's going on? It's happened to me before. It was actually the, the flip side. I was the one calling. I was in West Virginia. If you ever want to lose cell phone reception, drive through West Virginia. To any West Virginians watching this, I'm sorry, but that's just the way it honestly is. I remember I was calling my wife on the phone, and I was telling her that an emergency had come up, but do not worry, I would be home late. So I call her, and right before reception cuts out, all she hears, hey babes, there's been an emergency. And the phone cuts out. <laughs> now, and I go through a dead space for 45 minutes. For 45 minutes, my wife is calling me, right? I hear all the groans happening right now. She's calling me, what's, what's it doing? Going straight to voicemail over and over and over again because all she heard was babes. There's been an emergency. Of course, 45 minutes later, come out of West Virginia, all is okay. I hit the next tower, I get reception back, and all of a sudden my, my phone blows up <laughs> with all of these voicemails from my crying wife because all she knew was there was an emergency. That's, that's what Nebuchadnezzar is feeling right now. All he knows is there's an emergency. He has no clue what's going on. And so he calls his magicians, his sorcerers, his astrologers, to come before him and explain to him what he dreamed and what did it mean. Now that's going to seem weird. Like I mean, I can barely tell people what I dreamed. I certainly can't tell you what you dreamed, right? But notice, remember what they think. Babylon is steeped in sorcery and spiritualism. And these court magicians claim they could hear from the gods. So think about it. If you think dreams come from the gods, and you think this person can talk to the gods, well, can't they just ask the gods what you dreamed and then tell you the interpretation? I mean, it makes perfect sense in their mind. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar does. He calls them and says, come and tell me, what did I dream? But here's the thing. They didn't want to play ball. They didn't, see, that's, -uh, that's not how it normally worked. How it normally worked, Nebuchadnezzar just told them the dream. And they could come up with the interpretation. But that's not what happens here. And so the scriptures say, Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, saying, O king, you know, li live forever, <laughs> bless you, <laughs> tell your servants the dream, and we will give you the interpretation. Notice, they are outright defying their king's command. Their king was clear. Tell me the dream, and then give the interpretation. Because here's the thing. They can give a false interpretation. They can easily be frauds. You can fake an interpretation, but you can't fake telling somebody what they dreamed. And Nebuchadnezzar knows that because he knows the stakes are high, that whatever the gods are trying to say to him, it needs to be heard, and he cannot deal with charlatans. And so he asks them, tell me what I dreamed, and they won't do it. And King Nebuchadnezzar becomes furious. The scripture continues, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, that is his advisors, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretations, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made in ash heap. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Notice how angry Nebuchadnezzar is. He's like, I'll kill you and burn your house down. 
That is literally what he said to the people. Then he meant it. And now it says they went out and they were killing the wise men. To be fair, we are about to learn they don't immediately kill the wise men. More likely, the Hebrew is telling us they went out to follow the king's orders, right? Because Daniel intervenes in just a moment because God is too gracious, listen, to even let these pagan wise men die. Because God wants to keep working through Daniel to speak to them, to even bring them to the one true God. And so God intervenes to Daniel, and the scriptures say in verse 19, then the secret that it was the secret of the dream was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So Daniel in the middle of the night receives the dream and its interpretation. He runs to the guard. Listen, he runs to the guard. Who's in charge of killing him? <laughs> That's faith right there, brothers and sisters, right? Daniel knows this guard. Um, I, I, I forget his name off the top of my head. But he knows this guard is to kill him. And he runs to him. And he tells the guard, hey, wait, 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 wait. He says to the guard, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king its interpretation. So then Daniel goes before the king, and as King Nebuchadnezzar looks at one of his most trusted advisors, he says to him, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation. Right here, Daniel's about to prove he's not like the rest. He's not a charlatan because he is the one advisor in the court who really does talk to a God, the one true God, the God of heaven. But Daniel does not want to take credit for what God alone can do. Now picture this. He knows there are guards searching to kill him, he knows there are guards wanting to go out and kill the other wise men. The king is about to kill him and burn his house down, okay? And the king asks him, can you give the interpretation? And the first words out of Daniel's mouth are, no. <laughs> no. No wise man, enchanter, no magician, no astrologer can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever just, someone got just even a sentence of their answer, and you already know you're angry at them, right? Like, that is not what you wanted to hear. That's not what you agreed to. That's not what you said. They are just one sentence in, and this whole conversation is about to get derailed. And I envision, I want to be honest, the Bible does not specifically say Nebuchadnezzar got angry, but knowing how humans are, I can see him start fuming at this moment. But then Daniel wants to let him know the reason why. No, there is no wise man. There is no magician who can do this. But, but, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Think about this for a moment. How awesome is that? When given the moment, and Daniel could have hogged all the attention, he was still humble enough before this king to give glory to the one true God. And it's because he would give glory to the one true God, we're going to get ahead of ourselves here, Daniel outlives three kingdoms in that exact same area. In fact, we will look at his prophecy that after Babylon came two other kingdoms, everyone else gets killed, but you know who, who, who remains? Daniel remains. God trusted this man enough that he was in the inner court of not one, not two, three different kingdoms. I hope each of you are as full of integrity as Daniel. So when God looks at you, he could trust you to live all your days to his glory. Then Daniel begins to proceed and explain to the king what he sees. He goes on and says, O oh, king, Oh, you, O oh king, were watching, and behold a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. That's breathtaking, is what it means. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs 
of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watch while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. Chaff is this little tiny fine particle that happens as all the wheat is mushed together. So just think of it as fine dust. Daniel is literally saying the stone came, hits the statue, and grinds it up to the finest dust possible. So it just blows away in the wind. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Let's take a moment and summarize because we heard a lot in there. We want to make sure we have it together to understand the prophecy. First, Nebuchadnezzar sees an awesome statue. Something that literally was so amazing, it stole his breath away. But toward the end of the dream, he sees a, a rock that comes down out of heaven and strikes the statue on its feet. But then this rock grew and grew as great as a mountain until it filled the entire earth. Now, I envision that as Daniel's explaining this, Nebuchadnezzar's like, yes, yes, that's my dream. That is, what, that is exactly what, what I saw in my mind. Now, Daniel, tell me, what does it mean? And so Daniel proceeds to begin giving an explanation of what the dream meant. So as we look at this now, we want to ask ourselves, what did the dream mean to Nebuchadnezzar? And what did the dream mean for you and I today? Let's look at it. Daniel says, this is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the, birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. So let's be clear here. We find a prophetic principle. Before we even get to the other medals, we already understand that these medals will represent kings and kingdoms. And Daniel begins by telling King Nebuchadnezzar he is the head of gold. Now by say, putting him at the very head, he, God is saying he's one of eminence. He is one of prestige. He is one of power. But even with all this power, there's an important lesson that Nebuchadnezzar needs to learn. He may be top dog in Babylon, but he ain't top dog in the universe. What God needs Nebuchadnezzar to understand is that yes, he is powerful. Yes, he has dominance. Yes, everyone is bowing before him. But the only reason Nebuchadnezzar has any of those things is because the God of heaven allows it. And God is here to tell him that one day, even kings will stand before the God of heaven. Yes, he is the head of gold. But God says to King Nebuchadnezzar that, that after you shall arise another kingdom, one inferior to yours. And that we see is exactly what happens after Babylon. There is a kingdom that arises after Babylon who is indeed inferior. But let's, let's take a moment and unpack that for a little bit. Babylon was the gold gem of the Middle East. It was impenetrable. In fact, if you look here on the screen, you will see exactly what is going on in the city of Babylon. The city was 56 miles in circumference. That's 14 miles on each side. Um, and it was, it was surrounded by two double walls. These double walls were over 200 to 300 foot high, depending which one you're looking at, and they were 20 feet thick. The second wall was 75 feet behind the first wall, and the reason was because 
if somehow impossibly you break through that first wall, you have 75 feet of tar, of oil, of arrows and flame hitting you. And if all of that was not enough, he even built a giant moat around it. You know, nowadays we like to use the joke that it's as impenetrable as what Fort Knox, right? Now, I don't know what makes Fort Knox impenetrable. Probably they don't want you to know, right? But I know what makes Babylon impenetrable. And there is no way you're going to get through those walls. The point is that Babylon felt it was secure. But God said, after you, there will come a kingdom inferior to yours, but it will indeed overthrow you. How in the world could that happen? Well, we know from, oh, I got a little ahead of myself here, I'm sorry. Daniel 2.39, just to show you, the Bible does say what I said it said. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. And what was that kingdom? It was the kingdom of Persia. Or historically it would be uh, Mede and Persia. Media Persia. Now, how was it that this little tiny nation, who actually was two nations combined, and in fear to Babylon, how did it conquer that great nation? Well, do you remember earlier how I talked to you about that moat that went around the city? You see, Babylon was built on the main river of the area called the Euphrates River. As far as the Babylonians were concerned, they had enough food and water. They could spend five to ten years with a siege and never once worry about defeat. But the Persians came up with an idea. They knew they could not go through Babylon's walls. They knew they could not go over Babylon's walls, but they could go under them. And so they decided that they would begin building a dam miles upriver and completely divert the river, thus lowering the Euphrates River, and they can march right underneath those gates, come right in the city, and launch their attack. And that's exactly what the Persians began doing. They began to divert the Euphrates riverbed so that the riverbed would drain. And then they would walk right underneath the walls, enter the city, and that's what they did under General Cyrus, King Cyrus. And they were able to attack Babylon, and they sacked the entire city. Now, if you're thinking about this, you're going to ask your voice, okay, wait, hold, 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 okay. So you're telling me, hold up, let me make sure you get this, you're telling me, That somehow, this weaker nation has an army coming up in the dust, and the scouts never see this army coming. Number two, you're telling me that they take days to drop this riverbed down, and no one just notices the river is going down a little bit here. And then you're telling me that the army continues to march, and the scouts still don't see the army is coming. And you're telling me that the soldiers, that the soldiers somehow in Babylon were incapable of even giving a slight defense against them. How is that possible? Well, first I'm going to say it's possible because God said it was going to happen. That's what makes it possible. But there's also another reason, because the king was throwing a drunken party for his entire kingdom. In other words, uh, King Darius had gotten everyone so drunk, they were incapable of literally even standing in defense of their own city. Now, when I think about all of those that had to come together, the scouts could not see the army coming. No one noticed the river going down. No one noticed the army approaching. They came in when everyone was drunk, just so happens. And it just so happened that the people surrendered the city because they couldn't even put up a fight. Now, some people will say, that's a coincidence. Well, I'm going to say one coincidence, maybe. But when you stack seven big ones all together, that all are needed in order to make this nation fall, I don't think I want to say it's coincidence anymore. I want to say it's Bible prophecy coming true. So when God said an inferior kingdom would defeat Babylon, he was right. But Persia, it's not going to last forever. You see, we know that another kingdom, a third kingdom of bronze, would come after Persia and would rule over all the earth. For those of you who may know your history, the next country after Persia was none other than Greece, right? Led by Alexander the Great. Now, Greece dominated 
from 331 to 168 BC. But here's the cool part. Greece defeated Persia in a way the historians can only call miraculous. You see, Greece never should have beat Persia. By this time, Persia was no longer inferior. They were a strong kingdom. And yes, Alexander the Great may have been expanding in Macedonia and down into India, but he wasn't a match ready for Persia. And they knew it. In fact, when Alexander the Great marched his army against Persia, Persia outnumbered him 20 to 1. 20 to 1. And yet Uriah Smith, in his commentary on Daniel Revelation, he says that suffice it to say that the deciding point of battle that's between Persia and Greece was reached on the field of Arbella in the year 331 BC, where the Grecians, though only 1 to 20 in number as compared to the Persians, won a decisive victory. Let's be clear here on this. Historians are going to tell you this. This was not just a victory. It wasn't just that Greece beat some of Persia and ran away. This isn't guerrilla warfare. This was the turning point of the war. Literally, Greece, outnumbered 1 to 20, not only won the battle, but they won it with such power, it literally led to Persia crumbling. Now, when's the last time you heard of a battle where someone was outnumbered 20 to 1, not only winning, not only winning a decisive victory, but that very battle be the turning point of the war. Now, I like to study history, and I've never heard of such a thing until this. Could it be a coincidence? It could be. But when these coincidences begin to add up, I believe we're seeing with our own eyes the Bible prophecy is coming true. But even for as strong as Greeks may be, they were not going to last forever. Daniel said another kingdom would come, a fourth kingdom, shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And the, the kingdom that came after Persia was the kingdom of Rome. Now, iron is a good way to describe Rome, isn't it? This kingdom lasted for over 600 years. They were the terror of their world. They rampaged everywhere, brought everyone under their oppression and subjected them. They indeed were an iron kingdom. I love how Edward Gibbon in his book, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, put it. Now I want to be clear here, Edward Gibbon is not a Christian. He is not, as far as I know, he does not have any Christian religious affiliations. And yet, notice the language he uses describe all four kingdoms including rome the images of gold <laughs> silver or brass that's also bronze that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successfully broken by what the iron monarchy of rome now just, just let us sink in for a moment he's not a christian he does not believe bible prophecy he does not believe what you and i are learning today and yet he uses <laughs> the exact same biblical language to describe not one, not two, but all four kingdoms that we read about in the book of Daniel. Even atheist historians will tell you that iron kingdom was indeed Rome. So we've seen so far four ancient kingdoms that the Bible foretold in advance with beautiful accuracy. But it does not end there. Actually, something is about to happen in prophecy that creates a turning point in all of world history. Because you see, up until then, whenever a country or a nation ruled, it was the, it was the big daddy. It was the superpower of its day. And it meant differently than when we say superpower now. They meant they literally controlled the entire then known world, okay? And they, their power could go off to any direction they wanted it to. But God says that from that moment on, there was not going to be any one superpower that controlled everything again. In fact, the world would split. Daniel goes on and describes, whereas you saw the feet and toes Partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. 
Yet the strength of the iron shall be put in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic and clay. The feet of iron and clay represent kingdoms that would come from a divided Roman Empire. Some will be strong like iron, and some would be weak like clay. And likewise, what we see is Rome, when it fell, fell into multiple nations, some strong and some weak. But notice that the Bible prophecy also says they'll never cling together again. In other words, Europe will never be fully united. As we see Rome begin to divide, we see that it goes off in multiple directions. Now, th these are not all of them, okay? But what I want you to see here is that from what fell from Rome, we get many of the major nations in Europe that we have even to this day. But Bible prophecy is clear. They will not mingle with one another. Daniel says, As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere or cleave to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Very simply, what we are seeing here is saying that no matter what may happen, there in Europe, it will never be united again. And here we see, for over 1,500 years, people time and time again try to prove God wrong. Many people, kings, queens, dictators, and emperors, all believed in their heart they were stronger than God Almighty. And they were going to forsake this prophecy, and they were going to prove it wrong. And person after person tried to unite Rome, and they all failed. Charlemagne tried, and he failed. Stalin tried, he failed, thank God. Hitler tried, and he failed, thank God. God. All three of these people had worldly ambitions. They were first going to control Europe and then from there control everything else. But God's prophecy stood firm. Even when they got close, they weren't close at all, and each one of them failed. In fact, one of the men who got the closest was probably the Emperor Napoleon himself. He, however, understood why he failed. In his journal, he wrote of his ambitions. He said, there will be one Europe. There will be one currency. There will be one language. There will be one government over all of Europe. Now I'll pause here for a moment. You know, you know maybe you've heard of the one government, you know, new world conspiracy, right? People get all afraid about that. Oh, the Illuminati's behind it, right? Or the Freemasons are behind it. Now I'm not going to get into all that right now, but I'm going to tell you this. We see a man in the past who had power, and he did want a one world government. He did want to bring in total control, and he wanted to prove God wrong. And so he tried to conquer all of Europe, and he almost succeeded until he went up against the Duke of Wellington. And as Napoleon began to march his troops into that final battle, an uncharacteristic, see how these coincidences keep coming up over and over again? <laughs> this uncharacteristic snowstorm just happened to come out of season, freeze the entire ground, and drown everything in ice. And it forced Napoleon to wait. That gave the Duke of Wellington, who was not affected by the ice and snow, time to get the reinforcements he needed to face Napoleon. Now still, Wellington was still outnumbered. That coincidence happening again. He was outnumbered. And we, they knew that Napoleon was probably a better military strategist. But once the ice melted and the two met on battlefield, there was more than just man versus man that day. And Napoleon knew, that, knew it. Even though he would maneuver his troops one way, Wellington would make a move he never saw, and Napoleon would be defeated. He would try to move his ammo to one area, only for a storm to come by and destroy it. Finally, Napoleon understood he was not going to beat the Duke of Wellington, and he had to withdraw. But unlike the others, he knew why he failed. In his own words, after the defeat of Waterloo, he simply wrote in his journal, God Almighty is too much for me. He understood who he was really against. He was not just against the Duke of Wellington. By trying to unite all of Europe, he was really against 
God. And because of that, he failed. But you might be thinking, well, well Pastor, that, you're talking about times of, you know, back then. Like that's, that's not all happening right now. Well, actually, we do see it trying to happen right now, maybe in a different form, but people are still trying. We know, for example, the European Union. Now, I remember when the European Union was first being formed, and I had some very well-meaning church members come to me and say, Pastor, I just, I don't know what to think about this. Daniel 2 clearly says that Europe will never be united, and yet they're literally calling it, what, the European what? Union. Something to unify your base. They said, well, Pastor, can we still trust Bible prophecy? I said to that member, she's now resting in, 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 in Lord Jesus, but I, I said there, I said, give it time. Let God show up. Let God show you what will happen, because what you're going to see they will still be separate governments. They will still have separate leaders. They will still have their own sovereignty and give it time and you will see people begin exiting the European Union. And that's exactly what we've seen, isn't it? Right? The European Union is not a government. It is a, at best, a confederacy of multiple governments that still have their own sovereignty. And even now, people are beginning to pull out of the European Union. Now, I'm not making a statement on its politics. I don't care about the politics. I care about prophecy. And I'm just saying when you look at it now, even this is not pulling all of Europe together. No, what God said was true, that it will never come together again. So what we see is Babylon is foretold, Persia, Greece, Rome, and the divided Europe that comes all the way down to today. But the prophecy is not over. Daniel continues, and remember, we are living in the time of divided Rome. Okay, we are living in that time of a divided Europe. We are in that part of the statue. What's the next thing that happens? Daniel said, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces what then does he say and in the days of these kings the god of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever then daniel says the dream is certain and its interpretation is Sure. Here Daniel is saying that there's a kingdom, a kingdom like a rock, that will destroy all others and will remain forever. Here Daniel is foretelling of the future kingdom of Jesus Christ. Throughout all the Bible, we see God described as what? A rock, a refuge. Jesus is the capstone, the cornerstone, the rock of ages. This is how Jesus is described. And that rock of ages is coming again soon. And when he comes, all the kingdoms, not just the ones in Europe, but all around the world will come to an end. And he will set up his kingdom to be a marvelous kingdom, an amazing kingdom, and a glorious kingdom. The rock will come. It will hit in our time. And we will see Jesus coming for us. Now this, brothers and sisters, I said earlier, brings us to our very day. This is a wake-up call. If you believe the Bible prophecy that we are in the time of a divided Europe, then we need to take what God is saying here seriously because the next kingdom is not America. The next kingdom is is not imperial England. The next kingdom is not Russia, it's not China. The next real kingdom is God's kingdom. And if his kingdom is the next kingdom, you better be asking yourself the question, am I ready to join that kingdom when that kingdom comes? I remember when I got done studying this with one of my atheist friends, who is now agnostic, he's at least open to the idea, we got done with the study, and he, he tried jabbing me. He goes, he, goes, let, he goes, let me ask you a question, though. He goes, if we've been in that era of divided Europe for so long, why is God taking that long to come back? Have you ever asked yourself that question before? Why does it seem God's taking forever to come back? 
Or maybe someone's asked you that question before. Why, when God can come right now, does he keep delaying his coming? Well, if you've ever thought that question before it has someone to ask you, I want to share this Bible verse with you. It says, come from 2 Peter 3, 9. And here the Apostle Peter, one of the original disciples, is speaking about why it seems God's taking forever. And that was back then, <laughs> right? Like 30 years after Jesus had died. And he said, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering, that's patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Notice what the Bible is saying here. Why is God taking so long? Because he doesn't want anyone to be lost. He is willing to be as patient as necessary so that as many people as possible will come to know him and accept him and know the salvation that he gives to us. Yes, earth's history is winding down. No, God cannot wait forever. But right now he's holding back as we'll see the winds of strife. And he's giving everyone an opportunity to choose him. But notice this. As strife grows, we can be sure that God's coming is soon. And as we looked at in our seminar last evening, strife is growing, isn't it? Anger, hatred, a lack of love, a love for pleasure is indeed growing. So we do not have time. And God knows we don't have time. And so right now Jesus is knocking on the door of our hearts, asking for us to accept him in the prophetic book Revelation. It tells us that as we approach the end, God will continue to do something amazing. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Let me ask you, can you hear Jesus knocking on the door of your heart? As you look at this Bible prophecy this evening, and you see that earth's history is coming soon to an end. I know that if you're listening with the ear of your heart, that God's knocking on that door. He's telling you that you can be ready for his kingdom. And it's a glorious kingdom, a wonderful kingdom. We're actually going to learn about the prophecies of heaven in tomorrow's place. So I don't want to talk too much about it right now, but you're going to find that it's a glorious event. It is a glorious kingdom where all pain, all death, all agony, all disease, all cancer, every bit of evil, it's gone and it's gone forever. That's what's coming next, brothers and sisters. Yes, we're going to have to deal with some antichrist. Yes, we're going to deal with tribulation. Yes, we're going to deal with the, the beast from the earth, the beast from the sea and the mark of the beast. All of that's going to happen, but never forget what it's pointing to. It's pointing to Jesus. It's pointing of how you can navigate the pitfalls of the end times so you can accept Jesus. Jesus' kingdom is the next kingdom. And I pray from the bottom of my heart that each of us will be ready. If you, where you're sitting today, or if you're watching, wherever it may be, if you hear the Lord knocking on the door of your heart, do not harden your heart today. Do not shut that door. Do not... Tell God no. Instead, say this prayer, Lord, I know that you are still in control of this world. I want you to be in control of my life. Today, I'm opening my heart to you. If you hear that door pounding and his fist hitting it and asking to come in, accept his invitation. I want to leave you with a story, but I want to give a disclaimer before I even tell the story. It's not meant to scare you. But it is meant to help you understand that when God is coming upon your heart, you don't know how much time you may have. I was preaching a series just like this in Florida, at the West Palm Beach. It was, it was great. It was awesome, actually. Four nights on, three nights at the beach. <laughs> it was a good time. But I met a gentleman who will just call Bob for the sake of the sermon this evening. Bob, and we'll call his wife Jill, were a wonderful young couple. They had just had a, a, a two-year-old boy. And um, Bob was interested in Jesus, but he, he just didn't know. He didn't know if he wanted to give his life to Jesus. 
And I remember we were doing 30 sessions there. Now, we're only doing 12 here. <laughs> but this was an old 36-week-long seminar. And uh, we would we pray with, with Bob. We would ask Bob, except Jesus, he'd always say, he's like, you know, I just, I don't know if I'm there. I don't know if I'm there. Well, finally, one night, I woke up in the middle of the night. I didn't know why. I just felt unease. And I called Bob on the phone. So I woke up this poor guy before he had to go to work. <laughs> I said, Bob, look, you know, God just woke me up in the middle of the night. And I had to call you and talk to you. You, you, you got to accept Jesus. And he said, you know what, Sean? I've been thinking about that. I think that's something I want to do. I said, oh, that's awesome. He goes, look. He goes, let me get done my shift. I'll call you. We'll talk about it. I said, awesome. Gets done my shift. He calls me on the phone. He says, look, you, you guys are doing baptisms, right? On your last, your last session. I said, absolutely. Anyone that wants to be baptized, you know, if, if you've been moved by the prophecies you've seen and you believe them, then yes, I, I want you to give your heart to Jesus. He goes, I want to do that too. He goes, can we pray right now that Jesus forgives me and accepts me, but this is what I want to do. He goes, I want to surprise my wife. <laughs> he said, I want to um, wait until you give an altar call. And I'm going to come down that time and I'm going to get baptized that day. I don't want to tell her. Well, uh, we proceed, and I get a phone call from his wife later that day. And she said, Pastor, she goes, you need to come to the hospital. You need to come now. So my gosh, what's going on? She said, Bob was in a car accident. He crashed into a semi-truck. Uh, he's in critical condition. He, he might not make it. And so I, I rushed to the hospital. Of course, and here's the thing. I wasn't their pastor, okay? I mean, she was Pentecostal. Uh, he was agnostic. He was on the fence at that time. Well, we know he accepted Jesus, but she didn't know that at the time, right? So I rushed to the hospital. I'm not even their pastor, but they let me in. And, you know, I'm trying to talk with him. She's just weeping. And she said, she said, Pastor, you know what the worst thing is? She goes, I might lose my husband not just here, but forever, because he never accepted Jesus. And I was able to tell her, like, hey, actually, let me show you these texts on our phone. I showed them to her. She began to weep. And she said, even if I lose my husband, I know I won't lose him forever because he accepted Jesus. Now, praise the Lord, Bob was okay. Bob did make a recovery. And he was, and, and he was able, of course, to raise his beautiful two-year-old boy at the time. But here's the point. What if that accident went the other direction? And that's happened before. I'll tell stories about that some other time how I've seen that go the opposite way and people not make a decision for Jesus. I've also seen people make a decision for Jesus and it still go a bad way. But Bob's went well. But look at the joy of his wife's face, knowing that even if the bad happened, she'd still be with her husband in heaven. Look, you don't know what's going to happen. I'm not trying to scare you, but I've been in ministry now long enough to have seen it enough times. It might not be today, it might not be in a year. It might not be in five years. But you can't put Jesus off forever. There's an evangelist named HMS Richards. And one day he is preaching to the people. And he's telling them, Jesus is going to come soon. You got to make a decision for him one time, one day or another. And this old guy stood up and goes, you preachers. <laughs> I don't know. I just guess that's how he sounded, right? You preachers. Have been saying for hundreds of years Jesus was going to come. He hasn't come yet. And HMS Richards asked me, well, Sir, tell me how old you are. He said, I am 89 years old. And Richards just gave him a very simple answer. He said, Look, Jesus might not come in five years, He might not come in 50, but for you, your time is short no matter how much longer the world may have. And that's true for all of us. Sure, Jesus might not come for another 100 years, but you don't got 100 years to wait, and neither do I. If Jesus is not in your heart, today is the day to accept him into your life. And so I want to ask you, if you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to listen to him as he knocks upon the door, just Raise your hand right now. Let him see those hands that he'll mark your name in the book of life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have shown us with this Bible prophecy that we can trust the Bible 
and we can trust you. And if we can trust you with our earthly life, we certainly can trust you with our eternal lives as well. And we know that someday soon, Lord, you will come and you will set your kingdom up forever. And there will be a kingdom without end, one that's ruled with peace, with grace, and with love. May we all see you there, Father. We say this in your Son's name. Amen. I want to thank you all.